It seems like you have geopolitics, you have this Fed repricing is basically adding to the dollar and we're basically wiped out the losses for of this year. Yeah, um, absolutely. Any more upside risk to dollar now? Well, there is because the market still thinks there's a outside chance that the Fed could still cut rates by the end of this year. So if you get this further validation that the Fed is pushing back against, let's say in the minutes this week and another raft of strong U.S. data, well, that positioning could, could unravel and still support the dollar a little bit. So, so our view is that, look, there was some complacency starting the year, just how fast the dollar had fallen, and we weren't that comfortable with it. So for us, we're going through this chop phase. I was going to ask you, what is a chop phase? <laughs> well, it's, it's one where the market actually has to take a breather and reassess the risk. Like, the dollar can't keep falling at the, at the pace that it was mm. from, from late last year. I mean, that was just a very outside move. So as a result, you kind of have to take into account what the Fed is saying. We have to take into account how quickly China can reopen. All these uncertainties, geopolitical developments and that's helping to rein in the dollar and giving it some temporary support but ultimately we don't think it's it's going to last the chop to the flop that's right well, <laughs> when is that going to go back how has that trade going to flip back then well that's, uh, yeah that's a good question so basically what will happen is we think once we have a bit more certainty to these uncertainties so when the fed is actually saying you know we're comfortable with the level of rates where we think it's appropriate and a certain, uh, additional modification in terms of you know inflationary pressures coming down uh, some greater visibility on China's recovery mm. so going into say late first quarter second quarter that's where we think that the, re the renewed decline in the dollar will start to take shape it's that's extraordinary what? that you know FX markets are notoriously difficult to predict and it, but when everybody seems to have the same narrative that's exactly what it tends to happen isn't it? and that's what we had at the beginning of the year that everybody was a dollar uh, dollar bear I don't know if everyone is a dollar bear. I, I think, the the year, I, think like I think people have been falling over themselves because it actually <laughs> popped this this dollar bubble very quickly, and then I think people are caught off guard. Our view is, you know, don't be surprised. It can end up being a lot weaker than what people are thinking towards the end of this year. There seems to be this kind of narrative now, maybe becoming more consensus about an immaculate landing, mm. right? That there's going to be no yeah. landing like even. Immaculate conception. Do, do, <laughs> no, <laughs> just talking about that. But do you subscribe to that view? Uh, We've gone from hard landing fears to maybe it's soft landing to no landing. I think people are making up the narrative as they, <laughs> as they go. Uh, that's the nature of, of markets. You know, look, I think, I think overall the way that the kind of the, the tea leaves are coming out, you know, the soft landing view has is, is got some credibility. I mean, the U.S. is actually looking a bit better than what people were, were f worried about a few months ago. As I said, China is, is showing signs of, of recovering, and even Europe has been surprising more on the upside. Yeah. Hopefully that's validated by the, the manufacturing and, and, and other ser service sector PMIs this week. That's, yeah, that's good news for the global economy, or less bad compared to what we had in 2022. Well, what, what about uh, Asian currencies? Uh, the, I mean, <laughs> the dollar's weakness has actually uh, helped out the central banks, done some of the heavy lifting for them. Now, uh, how, how does it all play out? And against two, I mean, uh, of course, it's going to depend on whether you have a current account deficit or surplus. Well, it's been a very bumpy ride for a lot of Asian currencies just in the last you know, yeah. month or so. Again, for right, for right reasons, because you know, the market has had to think differently about the Fed, that they're not necessarily done, yeah. and they're not going to be cutting. And as a result, you know, Asian currencies have, have been facing the pressure. But as I said, I feel like that's a temporary adjustment. Yeah. And, and also, let's be mindful that we're going into, in the not-too-distant future, uh, China's NPC, where there's probably likely to be a fairly positive message about how to get growth up and running. And yeah. that could bring a bit more idiosyncratic optimism back into these regions' currencies. And, and we were just talking about, you know, they've been pumping a lot of liquidity uh, with, with some of these net injections as well. What does that tell you when the PBOC stands? Well, I think from a, from a policy stance, they just want to, you know, it's no surprise. They want to make sure that liquidity is ample and, and to ensure uh, the recovery is, is forthcoming. So I think, I think it's a fairly prudent stance at this point. But as I said, I, I, you know, when I, when I think about that, that's actually a fairly constructive outlook for, for a lot of Asian currencies, you know, Thai baht or, or other mm -hmm. ones that uh, proxy stories. Yeah. Now, if I recall correctly, you turned into a pound and somewhat less as a euro bull uh, end of last year. Where are you with these majors? Well, we, we still think that there's going to be gradual upside uh, unfolding through the course this year. I mean, I, I, one of the first 
interviews we had back in early January, like we don't love the euro, we don't <laughs> love the British pound. They all, they go up by default rather than merit. But still, there's some positives coming through that, as I said, growth hasn't been as bad as what we thought. So they can keep grinding hard. So our target for euro is still 115 uh, for the end of 2023. Sterling versus the dollar up at 1.3. These are they may look like they're in a tough position right now, but it's yeah. there's a lot of, lot of runway until the end of 2023. You know, people are saying the BOJ could be that wild card this year, though, right? Macro wise. Um, we know who's been nominated. Has that changed your view in any way of how policy is going to play out this year? Well, it was a surprise to, to me in terms of the nomination. And because uh, I think most people felt that uh, Amamiya was going to be the likely person that would come in. Yeah. But now it, it's kind of thrown a stun grenade, so to speak, into how to think about the outlook for policy. And, and I think and that. What sense did you get? Because you were in Japan last week. So, you know, what, what sense did you get for that? Well, I think people are still trying to digest, uh, you know, the backdrop of, of this candidate. You know, back in the day, he was considered by some uh, as a dove. But I feel like, look, they're, they're, if you were a dove many, many years ago, a leopard can change its spots. <laughs> uh, there's no shortage of, of central bankers up, uh, that have yeah, changed. Yeah. And it's hard to be any more dovish than, than what Corona has been either, right? <laughs> I guess yeah, you could say. That's probably true. <laughs> um, in terms of where the opportunities are, do you focus more on G10? Do you focus more on Asia FX this year then? Well, I, that's, again, sorry, it's a very good question. I keep saying that. But I think that there is a very important building blocks that have been developing in Asia, mm. talking about China, talking about Japan. Yeah. And if the, if the renminbi and the yen, huge anchor currencies in this region, are stable to strengthening, as yeah. we expect, then the spillover to a lot of other Asian currencies should be net positive. So I think, yeah, Asia is very much on the radar for us. Mm. Mm. Uh, what could upend all this? I mean, of course, if the war gets even hotter in Ukraine and uh, we see more belligerence between Beijing and Washington, I mean, uh, is the dollar in the haven, uh, essentially. Well, look, I, I, we can't we can't look past that, right? I mean, because if there was another big energy shock uh, yeah. and that led to new terms of trade deteriorations for Asia or, or elsewhere in the global economy, then yes, it would probably feed into into a stronger dollar for longer. Uh, another another situation com coming back to the Fed. If the Fed ends up having to raise rates even more than what's already priced into the market yeah. for the end of July, that could also upset the apple cart. Does that mean that there's a potential still to to have a repeat of what we saw last year in terms of volatility wise or are those days well, kind of no, are things are improving I, at least? I'll never say never that is <laughs> not uh, not wise um, I, but it, it is a risk of course but yeah. it's not it, it's the risk to my central case and sure. that is eventually we're going to go into a new regime for the dollar and that it will be resuming its decline okay the chops that we have to watch the chop and then the flop the chop and the flop